Having just returned from a two-day trip to Geneva, I wanted to share my thoughts on this, my first experience of Watches and Wonders. Just to manage expectations, in this video I'm not going to talk about the new watch releases. There are plenty of far more knowledgeable people than me who have already done this or are doing this. Instead, I wanted to reflect on my biggest takeaways from this brief visit and my best moments. Mine is essentially a layperson's perspective, not least because I'm really only a private watch enthusiast, perhaps a bit like you. I certainly don't hold myself out as being any kind of watch expert. And given that I'm not in the watch trade, I felt very privileged to attend the first couple of days of Watches and Wonders. And if I'm honest, at times, I felt a bit like an imposter because the start of Watches and Wonders is specifically for watch industry professionals. Indeed, access isn't open to anyone that isn't in the watch trade unless you have one of the trade players register you to attend. And so for me, this was only possible courtesy of Wilhelm Schmidt at Arlang & Zona. Thank you, Wilhelm. And also to everyone on the Arlang & Zona stand for your kind and generous hospitality. My personal levels of excitement started to build in the weeks leading up to Watches and Wonders. It was abundantly clear from searching online for flight and hotel availability that Geneva would be buzzing. Watches and Wonders is held at an exhibition centre located right by Geneva Airport. And so I decided to book into the Nash Airport Hotel because of its proximity to the venue and also because at around 550 Swiss francs, it was the cheapest room I could find. I'd set aside two full days of the week to fly in on Tuesday the 9th of April, stay for one night and leave on the last flight out of Geneva the following day. For me, this trip represented a bit of a personal indulgence. Watches are a passion and a hobby for me. I was going to go alone, to take it all in, see what was what, and just to look at watches. I only knew a handful of people that would be there, and, and I went with no preconceived expectations and no real agenda. One thing I did plan was to take two of my watches with me to see if, on the off chance, I could learn more about them. Both had been gifted to me by my father some time ago. They'd been in his possession for decades and he didn't know or remember much about either this Piaget nor this Vacheron Anne Constantin. I emphasise the and because the brand dropped the and in 1970, so this watch is at least as old as me. The only other thing I planned was, what watch should I wear? Given that our Lang & Zona enabled my attendance, it had to be one of my Langer watches, and to my mind, it was always going to be my Langer one. Once registration set, you can download a QR code entry ticket to the wallet on your phone, and also the app, which I found worthwhile. The Watches and Wonders app afforded me a structure for the two days I was there, enabling me to see what presentations were scheduled in the auditorium and to register to attend these events. Helpfully, there was also a map of the venue. Latterly, I realised how helpful the My Agenda section was because it also provides a record and a memory jogger of what you got up to. There's so much going on, it's easy to forget. Tuesday 9th of April was an early start. I had time to kill at Heathrow Airport, so I started as I meant to go on and visited Watches of Switzerland. What surprised me was learning that apparently the Rolex Airport Boutique in Terminal 5 has around 14,000 people on their database with a registered interest. As and when a watch comes in, they notify their database and give interested parties a few days to come in, pay and collect the watch. I imagined there would be a lot of dropouts when the time eventually came to receive a call from the boutique. However, it seems that the vast majority of people, almost all, come in to acquire the watches as they become available there being very few that turned down the opportunity. The sheer scale of this ever-ready demand for new watches as soon as they come into the boutique is incredible. On boarding the very full flight to Geneva and taking my seat, the gentleman in the next seat recognised me. It turned out that we had briefly met some time before. 
He too was headed to Watches and Wonders in his capacity as a lawyer for one of the bigger brands. We started talking and frankly didn't stop all flight. We talked about all sorts and of course regarding watches and watch brands. It was fascinating to hear his perspective, having been to Watches and Wonders for many years. What a small world. This chance encounter was just the start of things to come. Watches and Wonders is a very friendly, sociable people experience. My flight companion and I met a few times at the exhibition in between meetings and presentations. The first thing I did on arrival was to visit Bremont's stand, partly because it was closest to the cloakroom by the main entrance, but largely because Bremont was the brand I most wanted to see. It was my main curiosity for this visit. If you've seen my previous videos, you might already appreciate that I've long been a Bremont fan, having bought many of their watches. And as one might expect, the role of the two founders, brothers Nick and Giles English, has changed since the arrival of Davide Serrato, the new Bremont CEO who came on the scene less than a year ago. And as you may have seen from the various brand teasers issued by Bremont Online, Tuesday the 9th of April was to be Bremont's big reveal, when they showcase many of the changes being brought in. Since Serato's arrival as CEO, a lot has happened at Bremont, and quickly. The night before Watches and Wonders, I received an email from Bremont, an early preview of what's to follow. So, on arrival at the Bremont booth, I wasn't surprised to see the company's new branding, featuring what they call the Wayfinder. Although, I have to confess, it did seem a, a little surreal. And then there's the entirely new range of tool watches, presented within three themes, air, land and sea, the sense of adventure being embodied in the latest brand ambassador, the super talented and highly accomplished mountain athlete and award-winning director, Jimmy Chin, who appears to echo the take it further strap line in everything he does. Shortly after Serato was appointed, I read an article in the FT that quoted him as saying that in five years' time, he would be opening a case of champagne to celebrate achieving the milestone of having sold 30,000 watches in a year, amongst other self-imposed targets. To achieve this in the time frame requires a three-fold increase in the annual volume of Bremont watch sales, so something radical was always going to be necessary in order to measure up to this aspiration. And radical it is. Davide is a really good talker, and he verbally articulates his vision well. There is logic to his approach. He's created families of Bremont watches that are smaller, with unique and distinctive design characteristics, and he's slashed the retail prices to broaden the appeal. As a longtime Bremont fan, my concern is what mass market volumes and hitting a price point does to a brand. Plus, I can't help but struggle with the new logo. Whilst the watches I saw were decent, each time I looked at the dial and saw the Wayfinder emblem, a couple of things spring to mind. Firstly, I don't recognize it as being a Bremont watch. And secondly, I find that the logo is too detailed to be visually coherent when shrunk down to fit on a watch dial. Looking at the comments online, the initial response to the new logo is largely poor. For what it's worth, Mrs. Watch Enthusiast London thinks it's clip art. In her opinion, it's so bad that she believes Davide Serrato must be some form of mole or double agent. Having now spent two days thinking about the changes and after revisiting the booth to listen to more of what the brand had to say, I think I feel slightly better about the watches. On risk, they do surprise to the upside. And the repeated and frequent images and videos online do help to make the new range of watches seem more familiar. But for all the good talk and imagery that Davide Serrato and the Bremont marketing team put out, what I believe is missing is more of an explainer involving the absent founders and perhaps their outward involvement in some way, if nothing else to hand over the baton. So far, the brand has been pretty silent on what role Nick and Giles are to, are to play going forward, and I can't help but think that this needs to be addressed within the new narrative. Perhaps I'm too emotionally invested to see straight on this. Being completely bloodless about it and setting my emotions aside, 
I don't doubt that Bremont will eventually succeed. However, the extent to which I remain a Bremont customer is a little less certain. The Arlang and Zona stand is amazing. As with previous years, their newest novelty is displayed in supersized form, both front and back. This showpiece itself is a, is a masterpiece. At various times over the two days, I visited and revisited the Langer stand, making an appointment to see and handle the new watches up close and personal. I was very pleased to finally see last year's novelty, the Odysseus chronograph. However, the unfortunate reality is that every Langer watch I wanted to see was unobtainable, basically not for sale. My understanding is that even if I were ready and willing to pay the fantastic prices they command, they're already all sold out. Watches and Wonders is a really big show, and I gather that this year is one of the biggest yet. Previous dominance by Richemont brands has now proliferated, with more than 50 brands being exhibited. Initially, I did wonder whether two days was perhaps one day too long. However, I now know that I could have easily spent three or four days at Watches and Wonders if I were to take my time and have a really good rummage. The presentations were varied. Hermes invited the assembled to creatively experiment and play with clay. Mine wasn't really very good at all. And Gégé Lecoutre focused on the Made of Makers program as a theme and introduced a chef collaboration with Himanshu Saini, the ingredient scientist. Others, like Bremont, compared by the irrepressible Waco, introduced new product alongside new ambassadors. The most wonderful thing about Watches and Wonders is the friendly collegiate atmosphere. Everyone there is professionally involved and I wanted to be respectful of that. Of course, at Hello, they wanted to understand who I was and where I fit in. And at times I had to remind myself that unlike me, they were there busy working. So I decided to introduce myself as a watch enthusiast and to mention this YouTube channel to bring some context to my presence and also to give them an excuse not to talk to me if they wanted to move on to something more important or relevant to them. But that didn't ever happen. And I found myself in conversation with some interesting people and experts within the watch world. This was a lot of fun for me to see and sometimes speak to the bloggers, YouTubers and journalists who have, in my eyes at least, become iconic given my YouTube consumption. Teddy Baldassar, Nico Leonard, Justin Hast, George Bamford were all happy to engage and have a chat. I came clean when I met Richard Bank from Studio Underdog and explained that I was the chap who criticised the pink lemonade for being illegible overnight. I know that this affected the sales of the watch and yet he took this on the chin and even joked about it shortly before we parted company. Alexander from Watch Advisor very kindly invited me to join him on an interview he had scheduled with Zenith, so I happily tagged along with him and his team. What I hadn't quite appreciated before this was the intense pressure he and the team are typically under, given the tight time slots and the need to set up quickly, see the watches, which Alexander seems to like to do for the first time literally just minutes prior to filming so that his instinct, his first instinct is what you tend to see and get the necessary footage in the can to the highest possible standard before being moved on. I was impressed with Alexander's professionalism and focus but also couldn't help feeling somewhat sorry for him and everyone else who has to do this who have to work under such constraints. For a perfectionist when nothing is perfect on arrival, it's a tough gig. And then there's a wrap up and on to the next one. Having started at 5am by the end of my first day, I was pretty tired and headed back to my hotel room to freshen up and catch up on emails. It's been a while since I spent an entire day on my feet and I found it surprisingly hard on the body. By 7.30pm, having only half-heartedly attempted to find a party or dinner to go to, I decided to go down to the hotel bar and have a beer and continue working. Once I'd finished what I needed to do, I joined a few other guys at the bar, all of whom were obvious attendees at Watches and Wonders, and then stayed drinking and chatting into the early hours of the following morning. I enjoyed this immensely, just casually chatting about 
All sorts. Thank you to Giles in particular. It was one of those unplanned, spontaneous and memorable evenings. I had such a good night. I didn't rush to climb out of bed the following morning and I arrived at Watches and Wonders at around 10.30 a.m. Day two was busier than the first and I took the opportunity to see some of the brands that I hadn't seen the day before. By late afternoon, fatigue set in. There's always someone there who will offer you a coffee or perhaps something stronger. And I found myself visiting Oris, sitting down and talking to Paul, a long-standing employee who gave me the lowdown on the brand's history and its watches. Thank you, Paul. However, my best moment of the trip was an utter surprise and delight. As I mentioned, I took this watch that my father gave me to Piaget to see if I could find out more about it. My father doesn't recall. Here's Piaget's head of patrimony, who very kindly telephoned head office with the serial number taken on the back of the watch. And then he delivered this feedback to me. So, hello, I'm Jean-Bernard Corot. I'm head of patrimony at Piaget. I'm taking care about the heritage of the maison. And I'm very happy to discover your watch. So what I told you is that uh, this is a model that has been made only in six quantities. So only six exist of the same model, according to the archives. Uh, this one has been delivered in June 1973. And um, what I said is that at that time, uh, Piaget uh, was uh, having a very limited retail network, so it's on boutique, so we were, we were working with different agents in the world. And one of these agents was Muawad in Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah. And so what we know is that this watch was sold to Jeddah in 1973. After the story, we don't know. Probably your father bought it there or somewhere else. We don't know. So I don't think he remembers either. <laughs> see the story. And uh, we, we, we are able to tell you this because, in fact, you have numbers behind. And this, those numbers uh, uh, are uh, giving us information about the model for the year and also the movement. And uh, here, in fact, if I may say, you are very lucky because you have an interesting watch from Piaget with a wonderful decoration. You know, Piaget decided to only do gold as of 1957. So is this white gold? Or? Yes, it's white gold. Okay. It's very and, heavy. And uh, Piaget, in fact, uh, had a very great technique. You see the structure of the bracelet and you see that it's engraved on both sides, which is of very high quality. So there is a wonderful flexibility. You don't see any intersection. It's totally mastered, you know, it's fluid, flexible, and uh, perfectly, uh, in fact, if you have worn it, or if your father have worn it, you see that this piece uh, yeah. has almost more than 50 years and it's still yes. of very high end quality. It shows you the quality of the manufacturing of that time. I did wonder how this could be adjusted. In terms of- In sizes. terms of if my wrist was bigger or smaller. So at that time, in fact, uh, probably because you see there is no no screw on the side. That's right. You had, you had to go back to Piaget to have it uh, adjusted longer yeah. or shorter. Yeah. Or at least a jeweler. Yes. A watchmaker jeweler can do it probably locally, but uh, yeah. it's uh, because here it, it does not seem to have been modified. Well. We at that time we were not re registering really the size of the bracelet. Uh, I don't think it has been made on purpose, but probably it's depending if, uh, for instance, the agent placed an order of six model for a specific wish. Yeah. So then in that case, he could have given some specificity. And, and so to find out why there were only six made, is there any record of that? Would there be no, any record? We, we because, have, as you we, say, that's very specific. Yeah, we don't have. Uh, we don't have, in fact, the reason why. Yeah. Because uh, at that time, uh, it's a family owned business. So, what they are interested in doing is to create novelties, to have an identity, uh, mixing. And you see it very well. Huh? You have a mastery in watchmaking with a interesting movement. And then you have a wonderful uh, gold artwork. So, you see that there is no border between jewelry and watches. So, so you are lucky. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Isn't that a fantastic discovery? 
I've yet to establish anything more about the heritage of the Vacheron and Constantin. One of their team very kindly put me in touch with the right person at head office. However, she's requested the number from the rear of the watch. And there isn't one. To be continued. Thank you very much again to everyone I met at Watches and Wonders, both in and outside the exhibition hall, for making me feel so welcome. If you're considering going to Watches and Wonders and see this video in good time, it opens for the first time to the public from the 13th until the 15th of April 2024. All being well, I'd definitely be back again next year.